Hello. Today I'm writing an expert advisor for a breakout type strategy. Uh, you can see I've got it running in the strategy tester here. Over a period of time, it has created a price range based on specified start and finish times. At the end of those start and finish times, I've created a buy stop and a sell stop. It's already executed the buy stop. They each have take profit and stop loss points. And this will repeat each day based on the specified times. You may have seen strategies like this before. It's typically referred to as a London breakout strategy, but there is no reason why you have to trade based on London times. The London breakout strategy, uh, like most strategies, comes in and out of favor. So we're gonna write this almost from start to finish today. This will be using some code from the common toolbox and there'll be links for you to find that code. For this expert, I'm going to be writing the code for both MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5. I've already created some outlines here, the breakout MetaTrader 4 and MQ5. Uh, and the technique I'll be using for this, I've used many times before, where these two files, and I'll just open them because I've already filled this out. They're basically just the beginnings of a file and then an include statement, breakout.mqh, and all the logic then goes into breakout.mqh, and that way I can maintain a single code base for both MetaTrader 4 and 5. Also, to make the code base common, I'm going to be using the common toolbox here. Now, this common toolbox has been growing over a number of videos. If you haven't seen it already, I'm not going to be going through a lot of the details of this today, but I will leave a link to the playlist where you can see how this has been built up. Uh, and that takes you through every line of code that I've put into the common toolbox so far. The one change I will be making to this today is in the trade underscore MQL4 file, because to date I have only needed to place trades, position, open and modify here. But for today's video, I also need to place pending orders. So I need to create the order open function. The order open function already exists in the trade dot MQH file that's supplied for MetaTrader 5, but in order to make this common between 4 and 5, I have to create it inside this trade underscore MQL4 file. So I have trade underscore MQL4 open here, and as I said, you can see this being built up in the earlier videos, and there is a link to the playlist for that. I need to create an order open. So the position open functions that are already here will only open market trades. I now need to be able to open up buy and sell stop orders. Now this is the declaration of the order open function. It returns a Boolean, and this is exactly the same statement that you'll find if you open the trade.mqh file that comes with MetaTrader 5. So I need to make this identical because I'm going to be calling the same function from either MetaTrader 4 or MetaTrader 5. Now the arguments to this, the symbol, the order type, volume, number of lots, a limit price, a price, stop loss, take profit price, an enum order type time, which we'll get to in a moment, which is the type time and the expiration, and then a comment. Let's move down to actually writing the function. You can see I already have a position open function here. The order open is going to be very similar to this. The function declaration is the same as we had above. Symbol, type, volume, scroll across, mm -hmm. limit price, price, stop loss, take profit, time, expiration, and comment. The first statement here, clear structures, will just clear out any residual error information from an earlier call to this class. Check the order type. If it's an order type buy or an order type sell, then this is not the applicable function. This is only for buy stop, sell stop, buy limit, sell limit. So if you do call this with a type buy or sell, then you get an invalid return code. After that, it's as simple as for MetaTrader 4, calling the order send function, symbol, type, volume, price, zero for slippage, stop loss, take profit, comment, magic number, which is a member variable for this class, and the expiration time. And as I said, this function already exists for MetaTrader 5 in the trade.mqh file there. So this is only to maintain compatibility between MetaTrader 4 and 5. Having done that, this enum order type time 
It's an argument that is not used in this function because MetaTrader 4 doesn't use it, but I need it to be there so that we have compatibility with MetaTrader 5. And so I need to make sure that that enum is compatible for MetaTrader 5. Now I have created this enum in the past and I'll just scroll up. Here it is because this doesn't normally exist for MetaTrader 4. It's built into MetaTrader 5, but in MetaTrader 4 I have to define my own. When I've created this in the past, I only needed a single value, order time, good till cancelled. But now I'm going to insert three more values and that will make it completely compatible with the MetaTrader 5 version. And for my purposes, in the expert that we're writing today, I'm going to be using order time specified, although for MetaTrader 4, that will have no impact as an argument. It's ignored. It's only there because I need to make sure that the function is the same as it is for MetaTrader 5, and that way the code that I write is common for 4 and 5. And those are all the changes that I need to apply to the common toolbox. And now, as I said, I have breakout.mq4 and breakout.mq5 and they both include breakout.mqh. Open that file, and I have the beginnings of the file here already, just the comment, the properties, a space here for inputs. I'm including the trade custom from the common toolbox. So let me go back and say, view the navigator here in the common toolbox, there is this trade custom, which in turn inherits from trade, and you can see I've got conditional statements here for MQ4 and MQL5, and that's how I'm maintaining compatibility with a common library. So I include that, and then I declare a variable that I'm calling trade, and this is of type C trade custom, not type C trade. So that's, again, for the compatibility. If you're using MetaTrader 5, this will give you access to all of the features of the C trade class for MetaTrader 5. And if you're using MetaTrader 4, it will give you enough for this particular expert because I'm only adding features as I need them. Now this particular breakout strategy uses a time range, so I need a couple of inputs to specify the start and the finish time. I'm entering these as strings and the format will need to be hours, colon, minutes. I've put that in the comments here that you'll see when the inputs show up. Uh, and by default, I'm going from 0, 1 until 0, 9. But I will need at some point to convert these back to actual date times. And to do that, I'm going to create two global variables to hold the start and the end time. And I'll be calculating the values for these two from the inputs when I validate the inputs in the initialization function. The next input I will need is a gap. So once a range has appeared between the two times and I've calculated the range based on the maximum and the minimum price in that time range, I then want to allow that you don't enter a trade until it has moved a certain distance outside that range. So I'm entering this in points, input price gap points, and I'm defaulting that to 25 points or two and a half pips. Change this as you need. Um, and the buy stop and the sell stop will be placed 25 points outside the range that is defined by these times. Next, I want to determine the take profit and stop loss positions, and I'm going to set these as a percentage of the size of the range. I'm capturing these as doubles, input double, input profit percent and loss percent, and I'm just defaulting these to 100% of the range. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and they will be 100% of the range away from the entry point, which at the moment is 25 points outside the range. And then just some standard information that I need. So a default order size, which is 0 0.01 by default here. A trade comment, and I'm picking up the file name as the trade comment. Feel free to change that to a comment that makes sense for your own expert. And a magic number, I've just set that to 21, 21, 21. Now, just as I'm going to convert the start and end times from strings to actual date times, I need to convert the price gap points from points to an actual price value. So I'm going to have a place to store that as a global variable as well. And I'm just creating a variable called price gap 
and initializing it to zero, but I will set that later. Now also as part of this trading, we want to trade when the price has exited from the date time range. So I need to know firstly, am I inside that range? And then as soon as a tick happens that is not inside that range, I know that I've just exited the range. So I'm just going to create a Boolean variable that I can use to determine that I'm inside the range. And the default start for that is false. And then I have one more variable because there are some things that I want to do on the very first pass through the on tick. And I just need to know if this is the first time through. And I'm imaginatively calling that first time and just setting it to true. And then when it runs the first time, I'll set that to false. So down to the on init section. As I mentioned above, I've created this trade object of type C trade custom. The trade object gives me access to a number of functions to place trades and orders, but those functions to place trades and orders don't accept magic number as an argument. So I need to set that on the trade object. And because that value doesn't change for the duration that this expert's running, I'm just going to set it once in the on init function. So the function call for that set expert magic number, and then I'm passing my input magic. And now I want to verify that the inputs that I've received are valid inputs and actually convert some values. So I'm just creating a variable called result and setting that to init succeeded initially. And then I'm calling the validate input function. Now the syntax I'm using here, you can see I've got result equals validate input. I've put that inside parentheses and wrapped all of that inside an if statement. What that will do is firstly execute this statement where result is set to the return value from validate input. And then it will take that return value and compare that not equals with init succeeded. So I could have written this in two statements. I could have said result equals validate input. And then if result is not equal to init succeeded, this is just a short form for that. And so if the result of validate input is not init succeeded, then I just return that result. And assuming that passes through, then I have had a valid result. So I just return init succeeded. So this will simply validate that the inputs are, are good. And if not, then we'll fail. Let's just go to the bottom of the code now and we'll write that validate input. So it's a simple validate input, no arguments, returns an integer. First thing I want to test is that the start and end times must be different. Because there's no point in running a range if the start and the end times are the same. So I'm just comparing the two strings initially. I haven't converted these to dates yet. If the two strings are the same, then I simply say the parameters are incorrect. And now I'm going to convert these strings to valid date times. And you may have seen this from the earlier video that I mentioned where I calculated ranges to draw on screen. And I'm calling a function that I'll also write for that, which is called valid string to time, which takes this string and converts it to a time and also determines whether this string is a valid time. And we'll get to that next, but before I do, I'll just finish this off. So the valid string to time will actually return zero if the strings passed in are not valid dates and times. And so if I get start time coming back as zero or end time is equal to zero, then it means that one of these two was an invalid time string. And then I simply print an error message and return parameters incorrect. Otherwise, returning init succeeded, and that's the end of the validate input. So now to the valid string to time function. It's a simple function. I use it quite often, though. Uh, first, I'm capturing the current time. Date time now equals time current, and this is the server time. Then I convert the time string passed in into a time using the string to time function. I'm adding in time to string now time date. So I'm getting the date component from the current time because the time strings that I'm passing in are only hours and minutes, not including a date. So I need a date component here. So string to time, current date plus space, that's the separator between date and time, plus the time string. 
and that just converts all of that into a date time variable. Then I'm reversing that conversion. So I'm calculating a string test equals time to string using the result and just getting the time minutes. So time minutes actually returns hours and minutes. So this will give back something in the form hour, hour, colon, minute, minute. And then I'm simply saying if the test value is not the same as the time string passed in, then somehow I haven't been able to convert this time string into a date time and back again and get the same result and therefore it's not valid. And so I simply set result to zero and then I return the result. And so that concludes initialization. I've called this validate input function which has converted my dates and times to these start time and end time variables and I've completed the onInit function. So what's left now is to write the onTick function where we actually handle the price coming out of the date time range and then creating the buy and sell orders. The first test is is trading allowed. So trading might be disallowed for any number of reasons. It could be a particular time of the day where the broker is shut down for maintenance or there might be flags set on your account that prevent you from trading or you might simply not have enabled automated trading. So I've got a function for this rather than write all of the statements here. And I'll just go down to the bottom of the code now and write that. Now you can modify this as you like. I'm looking at four different things to determine whether I'm able to actually trade. Uh, is trading allowed at the terminal level? Am I allowed to do automated trading through MetaTrader? Uh, am I allowed to trade with an expert on my account? And am I allowed to trade on this account at all? So those four things together, and I have um, ampersands here, so all four of these must be met, and then it will return a true, otherwise it's going to return false. So go back up to on tick. If not can trade return, that just gets me out. There's no point in doing anything further. If this is a temporary stop because the broker has shut down for a particular time while they do maintenance, then this will just keep looping through on ticks until eventually it falls through this and then we'll get on with the rest of the code. Now I mentioned above that I have this first time variable. That's because there are some things that I want to do not during on init, but on the first pass through on tick. And that's because I want to make sure that the connection to the broker is complete and that we actually have data coming back from the broker. It's possible for on init to run, particularly if you already have the expert loaded onto a chart and then you start MetaTrader. It's possible for the on init to run before the connection to the broker is finished and before any data becomes available. And that's as simple as saying if first time then I'm calling a setup function and we'll write that setup function which will also reset first time. In my setup function then I'm capturing now, date time now equals time current, server time. I'm calling a function set range time, passing in now and we'll see set range time in a moment but that basically sets the start and end times of the range based on this current time. And then I'm also converting that input price gap points into an actual price value. So first I need to get the size of a point and I'm using symbol info double, I'm using the chart symbol and the argument symbol underscore point. That gives me the size of a point in this symbol. And then I multiply that by the number of points and that gives me this price gap, which is the global variable that we've already defined. And then I just set first time to false. So this won't be called again. Let's look at this set range time function now. I'll just write that. So for set range time, I'm passing in a date time, which is now. And first I want to find the end time that is the nearest end time after now. Now if you've seen the earlier video where I was drawing ranges on screen, I actually did this in reverse. I set the start time first, and that's because I need to look at this differently for the expert. I don't want to calculate the range that has just finished. If you start the expert and the range is already finished, then I'm not going to be trading. I'm going to wait until the expert has gone through a range and then trade. So I need to find the next end time after now. 
And rather than do the math on this, I'm finding the easiest way is to simply move the end time until it's before now and then move it back by a day. So this first statement for no initialization while end time is greater than now, end time minus equals 86,400, which is one day. So I go backwards until this is no longer true, which means that end time is less than or equal to now. And then I step it forward for, again, no initialization, end time less than or equal to now, I step forward by a day. So this will make sure that this is the earliest end time after now. And once I have an end time, I then need to calculate the latest start time that is before that end time. The syntax is very similar here. For no initialization, while start time is less than the end time, then I'm just going to move start time forward until eventually it reaches that end time. And then I just step it back by a day. So again, for no initialization, start time is greater than or equal to end time, start time minus equals one day. So I step the time back now, and that will make the start time the latest start time before the end time. And so that's all of the setup done. Now if we go back to on tick, now what I actually want to do is check to see if we have just left a range and should we be trading. So again, I'm capturing now using time current, that's the server time. And if now is greater than end time, then I must be outside a range. Now this should typically only happen once because as soon as I move outside an end time, I'm going to do some processing and then move the end time forward again. But just to be safe, I'm testing to see that I have just come out of a range. And remember I have this in range variable. So that tells me that at some point I have been inside the range. Now I'm past the end time, so I've exited the range, and then I'm calling a function to open the orders and then set in range to false, so I'm no longer inside the range. Uh, let's move straight on to the open orders function, and then we'll come back and finish this off. Now first, open orders, I'm getting the high and low, so I'm declaring doubles high and low, and I'm calling a function get range prices high and low. So this function is going to look back at the defined start and end times and get the maximum and the minimum prices within that range. And we'll be writing that function now. Once I have that, I'm calling another function called open single order, where I'm passing firstly the high and the low and opening an order type buy stop. And then I'm reversing that, passing the low and the high and order type sell stop. So I'm using the same function here to place the buy and the sell orders and I'm just reversing these because depending on the type of order I'm either trading above the high or below the low. Let's first look at the get range prices function. Now I want to get two values back at the same time. I want the high and the low so rather than have a return value I'm just returning void but I'm passing the high and the low as reference and that's why I've already declared them here, double high equals zero, low equals zero, and then I'm passing those as arguments, and they will both come back because I'm passing them by reference with this ampersand. Now, in order to get the values, I first want to know which bars correspond to the start and the end times. So I'm using the I bar shift function. So first I'm getting the start bar, I bar shift, chart symbol, chart period, passing the start time, and false. This will get the bar closest to the start time, so I don't need to get an exact match of that start time. But I would recommend that if you're going to run this, you should use a chart where the period matches the start and end times, because you don't want to be relying on the minimum and maximum. So if you're, for example, you're running a four hour chart, but you're setting a start time at a 15 minute, then you're going to get the minimum and the maximum from a four hour bar, not the minimum and maximum that correspond to the start time and end time that you supplied. Start time false, that gives me the bar number that contains that start time. The same thing with the end bar, but 
and again I'm assuming that you've set the chart periods to match the times that you're using I'm actually subtracting 60 seconds from the end time so let's imagine that you've used a one hour chart and you say that you want the end time to be 0, 0900 0, 0900 is actually the beginning time of a bar if you're looking at the range then you're probably only looking at the range up to the point where that bar started now normally this isn't going to be a problem because when the bar starts the price is just going to be very close to the beginning anyway but if there's been some delay because the brokers shut down for maintenance or something then you could find that by the time this runs finding that 0, 0900 bar actually introduces a new high or low that you didn't have before so I'm subtracting 60 here 60 seconds and if I have specified the end time as being the very beginning of a bar then this will actually move me back into the bar before that so now with the start and end bars I first just calculate the number of bars which is start bar minus end bar plus one so that's the total number of bars that I'm looking at and then I calculate these high and low values high and low using firstly I high symbol period from the chart and I'm finding the bar that has the highest value so I highest actually returns a bar number passing the symbol period mode high this tells which price I'm looking at so I'm looking at the high price for this symbol this period for the specified number of bars beginning with the end bar so that gives me a bar number using the I highest and then I use I high to actually get the price of the high value in that bar and then the same for the low but here I'm using I low and I lowest and mode low to get the low price so that finishes the get range prices here so after get range prices I had the highest and the lowest price in that time range and the other function I called was open single order and this is so that I don't repeat a lot of code in here I can call a single function to open an order and it will open depending it's a buy or a sell so I'm declaring the base price which is the price where I'm starting for the opening the order and the opposite price because I need to calculate the size of the range and then the order type first thing I'm doing is defining this multiplier I'm declaring it as a double and that is simply plus one or minus one depending whether I'm buying or selling so if it's a type is a buy stop then I'm buying and I know the only other value I'm going to be using here is a sell stop so it's either a one for a buy or a minus one for a sell I am determining the entry price for my trade so this is normalized double taking the base price depending if I'm buying or selling that base price will be high or low and then I'm adding the price gap which is the global variable calculated earlier multiplied by that multiplier so if I am selling price gaps a positive number but I'm multiplying it by minus one so I'm actually subtracting that from the base price and I'm normalizing double with digits and that gives me a valid price to trade for this symbol and then I want the size of the range because I'm going to calculate the take profit and the stop loss as percentages of that range and I don't need to worry about the multiplier because the base price will always be higher than the opposite price for a buy and because I'm reversing the order of these it will always be less for a sell and so price range is always going to be positive for a buy and negative for a sell So the take profit again I'm using normalized double but the take profit is the entry price plus the price range multiplied by the profit percentage divided by 100 because this is a percentage so that gives me the price range and I add that to the price and the stop loss is the same thing price range multiplied by the loss percent divided by 100 now if I'm buying then price range is positive so this gives me price plus a positive number if I'm selling then price range is negative so this is actually price minus the range and the opposite then for the stop loss now I also want these orders to expire before the next day or before the next end time so I calculate an expires time 
which is the end time. Now, I haven't moved the end time yet. This is still the end time that we've just left. End time plus 86,340, so that's one minute before the next end of day, or one minute before one day. And after all of that, I can simply call that order open function on the trade object. So some of these arguments are irrelevant for MetaTrader 4, but they are part of the order open function for MetaTrader 5. So obviously the symbol, the type, which is this type that was passed in, order size, which is our input. The limit price is zero because that's not needed. The price is the entry price for this type of order. Stop loss, take profit. Order time specified. As I said earlier, I've created the enum for that. Although it's not used for MetaTrader 4, it is used for MetaTrader 5. So I'm saying that I want to expire at that specified time. And then the trade comment. And remember that the magic number has already been passed into the trade object at the beginning of the code. And that's almost everything. We just need to go back to the on tick function because we left that without finishing here. So at this point, we've determined that now is greater than the end time. If we were inside a range, we've opened the orders and are now outside the range. So we've set in range to false. I now want to move those range times forward. I know that now is after an end time. So by calling that set range time function again, it will move the range so that the end time is now the next nearest end time after now. And then the function returns. Now, if the function hasn't returned, then it means we haven't passed the end time. So we're either inside the range or before the start time. If we're before the next start time, then there's really nothing to do. So we can simply return. And if we get to this point, then we must be after or equal to the start time before the end time. So we're now inside the range. And that's the end of that function. Now, the one thing I haven't handled here is weekend trading. Different instruments have different trade times, but typically instruments trade until the end of Friday and then no more trading until the beginning of Monday. If we've come through here on Friday, then the set range time will actually set the end date or end time to the end time on Saturday. In a lot of cases, that's not going to be a problem. So just to step through this, this is run for a Friday. The range time has been set to Saturday, the end date. The system will not operate again until Monday morning. On Monday, there'll come a point where we run this and now is greater than the end time because the end time is last Saturday. But we've never been in range because we've never gone past the start time. So this piece of code does not execute. And then we simply do another set range time, which moves the end time to the next nearest end time now. So that's a common situation. That may not work if your start time is before midnight and the end time is after midnight, because in that case, it's possible that start time is still Friday. So we will go into this piece of code because now we'll be after the start time on Friday night. Then during the weekend, we'll pass end time. And on Monday morning, this will execute if now is greater than end time. So to get around that, if you want to, you can add some code here to check whether the date matches or whether now is within a certain range of end time. So if now is actually too far past the end time, then you may not want to trade. And so what I'll do to build that in, I'm going to change if in range to being if in range and so I've added and now minus end time is less than 600 that's 10 minutes so if now is more than 10 minutes after the end time then this piece of code won't execute but we'll still go down and set a new range so that should handle most cases where you might be setting an end time during a non-trading period. And I think that's everything. Let me just compile this. I'm in MetaTrader 4, so I'll compile. 
Oh, I've missed a bracket somewhere. There we go. I've got too many brackets. And that's it, compiled. And so that is a complete working time-based breakout strategy with an entry point that is separated from the outsides of the range by a specified number of points and take profit and stop loss specified as a percentage of the range size. There are a lot of variations that I've seen to this type of trading and it's far too many to incorporate here into a single video but you can see where you might need to make adjustments to adjust for perhaps a fixed profit, fixed loss, uh, or including this number of points in the range and so on. If you found this useful, then please click the like button. And if you want to see more of our videos, click subscribe. And then if you click the bell icon, you'll be notified the next time we release a video. Thank you for watching.